Welcome back to New Rock Stars. I'm Eric Voss. And what if Sam Raimi actually directed a fourth Tobey Maguire Spider Man movie in 2011? This is the second episode of our new experimental series that explores the historical hypotheticals and alternate timelines in which our favorite movie franchises could have played out very differently. Last time we asked what if Edgar Wright directed Ant Man, and this time we are going to put some more dirt in Billy Maguire's eye. Time, space, reality. Movie franchise building is more than a linear path. It's a prism of endless profit possibilities where a single no thanks on a headshot can branch out into infinite better plot lines pitched on YouTube by nerds. Nerds who would make terrible movies if ever given the chance. Follow one of these nerds and ponder the question, what if? It's the night of July 7th, 2008, on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and La Cienega in West Hollywood, outside of Los Angeles' Medeo Ristorante. Toby Maguire, star of the previous summer's highest grossing film, Spider-Man 3, tries to drive out of the parking lot and is finding what many LA drivers know all too well. Due to the steep incline of La Cienega, the right turn onto the Sunset Strip is a dangerous blind spot for anyone trying to merge into traffic. Paparazzi exploit this traffic death trap to mob Toby Maguire with flashing cameras. McGuire slams his car door into a photographer and he screams, Get out of the way! I can't see! There are cars there, mother... It's a tough time for Toby. While Spider-Man 3 made nearly $900 million in 2007, now in summer 2008, superhero cinema was a clash of two different titans. Kevin Feige's Marvel Cinematic Universe launched him with Robert Downey Jr. starring in Iron Man in May and Edward Norton in The Incredible Hulk in June. And then in July, two weeks after Maguire's incident, would be the release of Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. These two forces would change comic book movies forever and arguably overshadow the trilogy of Spider-Man movies made by Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire. Still, after $900 million, Sony planned on a fourth Sam Raimi Tobey Maguire film with a screenplay in the works, storyboard art, a cast, and a release date of May 6, 2011. But 18 months later, on January 7, 2010, Tobey Maguire does press for his 2009 film, Brothers, for which he was nominated for a Golden Globe. Maguire gets asked about Spider-Man 4. How do we make it more exciting, more fun? How do we evolve the character and make it a, a rich story. Just four days after this interview, on January 11th, 2010, Deadline reports a press release from Sony declaring Sam Raimi's fourth Spider-Man film would be cancelled, that the studio would be rebooting the Spider-Man franchise. Spider-Man would now be recast as a high schooler in a film slated for May 2012. The role would later go to Andrew Garfield, leading to two films directed by Mark Webb. So what really happened here? Why would Sony hit the reset button on a billion dollar franchise? And if Sam Raimi knew this was coming, why didn't Tobey Maguire know just four days before the announcement? And what would have happened if things went differently on that hot July evening and Sony had still gone ahead with that fourth Sam Raimi Tobey Maguire Spider-Man film? Let's see what the world would have looked like with even more Bully Maguire. This story really begins decades earlier. 1993, Sam Raimi was releasing his third Bruce Campbell Evil Dead film, Army of Darkness, and begins to shift into other genres. Meanwhile, T2 Judgment Day director James Cameron has developed the very first serious Spider-Man script for Marvel, a 45-page script meant for Carol Co. Pictures, which held the film rights to Spider-Man at the time. James Cameron wants to cast as his Peter Parker, the 19-year-old rising star Leonardo DiCaprio, who this year in 1993 was one of the youngest actors ever to be nominated for Best Supporting Actor for the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape. So in 1993, Leonardo DiCaprio is considered part of the new Hollywood Rat Pack, self-described with the crass name of the Pussy Posse that included Leonardo DiCaprio, Kevin Connolly, Lucas Haas, Sarah Gilbert, and Tobey Maguire. As teenagers, DiCaprio and Maguire were often competing for the same roles, and in that year of 1993, they even both appeared in the Robert De Niro film This Boy's Life. But then, everything changed on the night of October 31st, 1993. Young actor River Phoenix dies of a drug overdose outside of LA's Viper Room, a club owned by Leonardo DiCaprio's co-star from What's Eating Gilbert Great, Johnny Depp. River Phoenix was only a few years old 
older than DiCaprio and Maguire, and the death was a major wake-up call for the entire L.A. party scene. In 1994, Tobey Maguire at age 19 enrolls in AA and gives up drinking. He and DiCaprio agree to stop auditioning for the same roles, a truce to divide and conquer the industry, and maintain their close friendship. Meanwhile, James Cameron's Spider-Man film stalls in development, Cameron moves on to True Lies, and then to Titanic, where he would become king of the world, and finally partner with Leonardo DiCaprio. 1998, Marvel emerges from bankruptcy, and the success of the 1998 Blade film, and progress with an X-Men movie at Fox, leads Marvel to sell the film rights of Spider-Man for $7 million to Sony, a deal that closes in 1999. Sony decides to move forward with James Cameron's 45-page scriptment. January 2000, Sam Raimi is hired to direct Spider-Man, and David Kemp is hired to write a full screenplay from James Cameron's treatment. Raimi keeps in place James Cameron's idea of an organic web shooter in Peter Parker's wrist skin. James Cameron had developed his version of the film from a rejected 80s version that would have made Spider-Man a body horror creature feature like The Fly. Tobey Maguire, having appeared in the 1999 award-winning film The Cider House Rules, is cast as Peter Parker. The film releases in May 2002, and it is a massive hit. It's the first film ever to pass $100 million in a single weekend, and it's 2002's highest-grossing film, beating The Two Towers in Attack of the Clones. It makes a worldwide total of $825 million. Pussy Posse alums Tobey Maguire and Leonardo DiCaprio had starred in Hollywood's two all-time highest-grossing films at the time. 2003. Tobey Maguire works on the prestige drama Seabiscuit and injures his back on set. His agents reportedly use this injury as leverage against Sony for more money for Spider-Man 2. Sony counters by considering recasting Peter Parker from Tobey Maguire with the replacement of Donnie Darko actor Jake Gyllenhaal. At this time, Tobey Maguire is dating a jewelry designer named Jennifer Meyer, whose father is Ronald Meyer, the head of Universal Studios. Ronald Meyer makes some calls and Tobey Maguire regains the role of Peter Parker in Spider-Man 2 for a $17 million contract. Toby's back injury is referenced as a joke in Spider-Man 2. My back! Bringing us to July 2004, Spider-Man 2 releases, making $789 million worldwide. Not as much of its predecessor, but it does buy a lot of pizzas. <laughs> Pizza time. But also in 2004, Bully Maguire makes his entrance. Tobey Maguire at this point has now taken up tournament poker. He's participated in the ESPN World Series of Poker, and starting in 2005, Maguire joins a series of secret high-stakes poker games hosted by socialite Molly Bloom, along with Leonardo DiCaprio, Ben Affleck, and various other VIPs. These games are held in the basement of the Viper Room, the very same club where River Phoenix died in 1993. Tobey Maguire's role in these games is recounted in Bloom's 2014 memoir, Molly's Game, which alleges that these games have buy-ins ranging from $10,000 to $50,000. Bloom claims that Maguire insists that they use a pricey card shuffling machine and charges her to rent it. Bloom also says Maguire is controlling over the guest list, he's the worst tipper, and in one instance told a then 27-year-old Bloom to climb up on the table and bark like a seal for a $1,000 tip. In the 2017 Aaron Sorkin and film adaptation of Molly's game, Tobey Maguire is depicted as a composite character codenamed Player X, played by Michael Cera. It's noticeable when you go out of your way to demonstrate that you have no interest in me. You did the same thing to Dean. These guys want to play cards with me, not you. During this time, Tobey Maguire shoots the third Spider-Man film with Sam Raimi. Development for this third film is even more fraught. Raimi wanted just Sandman and Harry Osborn Green Goblin as the movie's villains, but Marvel executive Avi Arad pushed to include Venom, knowing that the symbiote character's popularity would lead to gargantuan merch sales. Sam Raimi doesn't really know or like the Venom character, and the result is an overstuffed film in which Peter Parker's bad boy comes off as more of an emo loser. <laughs> But despite this, Spider-Man 3 makes nearly $900 million. It's the most profitable installment of the Raimi trilogy. Sony immediately greenlights a fourth film for Raimi and McGuire. Sam Raimi hires Zodiac screenwriter James Vanderbilt to write the fourth Spider-Man film. Raimi also commissions storyboard artist Jeffrey Henderson. From these storyboards, we know this film will open with Peter rounding up various villains, including Bruce Campbell as Mysterio. Bruce Campbell had cameoed in all three of the first films in various roles, and in the fourth film, all of those men would be revealed to be the same 
same showbiz wannabe and illusionist Quentin Beck, Mysterio. But the primary villain of this fourth film would be Adrian Toomes the Vulture, the role first considered for Ben Kingsley and then cast as John Malkovich. Instead of the feathered flight suit, this would be a military commando winged jetpack, similar to what we ended up seeing Michael Keaton wearing in Spider-Man Homecoming. Adrian Toomes' daughter in this fourth Spider-Man film would be a Felicia Hardy type love interest played by Anne Hathaway, but not Black Cat Anne Hathaway. This would be a female vulture who would take her father's place. Reportedly during this time, Sam Raimi is pressured by Sony to add the lizard to the villain lineup, again the studio hoping to boost merch sales. But any writing on the Spider-Man 4 screenplay would have come to a halt in November 2007 when the Writers Guild of America went on strike. The strike would be resolved in February 2008, but months after that, the world would enter a financial crisis and an economic recession. As a result of this recession, Molly Bloom, the underground poker ringleader, paused her LA poker games and moved them to New York in the year 2009. At that point, Bloom would get hit with a $116 tax lien in 2010, and then in 2011, one of her LA games was shut down as part of a Ponzi scheme. Bloom was arrested in 2013 for sports gambling and racketeering, and in 2014 pled guilty to a lesser charge. So back to July 2008. Get out of the way! I can't see! The Medio Ristorante in the steep turn from La Cienega onto Sunset. <laughs> Side note, this watcher only knows this specific traffic death trap because one of his first jobs in LA was doing lunch runs for another Pussy Posse alum who loved a particular vegan restaurant on Crescent Heights that required this watcher to heave his Nissan sedan up La Cienega onto Sunset and then eventually up onto Laurel Canyon without tipping the cashew cheese. So that night, July 2008, Tobey Maguire would have been driving into a Hollywood where he was dethroned as the face of Marvel movies by Robert Downey Jr. I am Iron Man. What the hell? Where the trades were predicting the Dark Knight would break all of Spider-Man's box office records. Behind him on the Sunset Strip was the Viper Room, where his underground poker game was falling apart. So he had gone from a nice Italian dinner to the f out of the way! I can't see! Breaking his car door on a photographer. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! So after Raimi's Spider-Man 4 is canceled by Sony, Tobey Maguire drops off the radar. In 2011, Maguire was announced to play a voiceover role for Ang Lee's Life of Pi, but was dropped from the movie for, according to Lee, being too recognized. Maguire appeared in no movies in 2012, but in this year established his own production company, Material Pictures. He wouldn't appear in movies again until 2013 in Baz Luhrmann's The Great Gatsby, alongside childhood friend and Pussy Posse alum Leonardo DiCaprio. In 2014, he played reclusive chess wizard Bobby Fischer in Pond Sacrifice, and then in the years after this, various online memes began to re-edit his scenes from the Spider-Man films to create a persona known as Bully Maguire. Aside from a few voiceover gigs, Tobey Maguire wouldn't have another major on-screen film role until his internet-breaking return as Peter Parker in 2021 Spider-Man No Way Home. Perhaps seeing what Spider-Man did to his friend, Leonardo DiCaprio, meanwhile, would advise rising star Timothy Chalamet, quote, no hard drugs and no superhero movies. And then I'm sure he also asked Chalamet, also, do you know any single girls your age? So, did Sony reboot Spider-Man in 2010 because of Tobey Maguire's gambling and his temper issues? We do not know know for sure. In every interview, Sam Raimi has taken responsibility. He told Vulture in March 2013 that he wanted to make Spider-Man 4 as a high note to fix his issues with Spider-Man 3, but that he couldn't get the script together in time and he didn't want to waste Sony's money, so he told Amy Pascal to go forth with their planned reboot that they would be doing anyway. In 2014, he told the Nerdist podcast, I tried to make it work, but um, didn't really believe in all the characters, and so that can't be hidden from people who love Spider-Man director doesn't love something, it's wrong of them to make it. So while Sam Raimi moved on to produce Oz the Great and Powerful with his franchise's alum James Franco, Sony moved forward with the same screenwriter for that 2011 fourth film for a 2012 reboot of the Spider-Man franchise. After Tobey Maguire had defined Peter Parker as an aw shucks Boy Scout grad student, they wanted their new Peter Parker to be moody, a high school outcast who skateboards, set to Coldplay. How do you do, fellow kids? What? Josh Hutcherson seemed like a good candidate. He had played an emo loner in 2010's The Kids Are All Right with Mark Ruffalo. And even Josh Hutcherson said recently that he auditioned to play Peter Parker, but he never heard back. And three weeks later, it didn't matter because he got cast in Hunger Games. Instead, Sony ended up casting Andrew Garfield following his breakthrough role in The Social Network. 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man makes an impressive 758 million, nearly as much as 2004's Spider-Man 2. But two years later in 2014, the sequel is seen as a critical and commercial disappointment. 
disappointment, making even less 709 million despite an increased budget. Sony, facing a particularly stinging year in which the studio had an embarrassing hacking scandal, decided to move forward from this as Amy Pascal agreed to reboot the Spider-Man franchise again in the MCU. After an infamous sandwich throwing meeting with Kevin Feige, Tom Holland is now cast in the role, set first to appear in Captain America Civil War, following a film co-produced by Marvel and Sony, Spider-Man Homecoming. We like to think of the internet as being a giant sea of content that's equally wet no matter where you are. But that's not true. Where you're physically located has a huge impact on what you can watch online. For instance, Netflix has over 18,000 titles in their catalog, but in the US, you only get access to like 6,500 of them. So that means you cannot see over two thirds of the content they actually have on there. But with the help of ExpressVPN, you can fix that. I use it all the time, whether I'm watching stuff for research for new rock stars or just for fun. ExpressVPN lets you change your online location with a single click of a button. They have over 100 countries that you can choose to apply hear from. So let's say you want to watch Rick and Morty on Netflix. It's not available in the US version of Netflix. So just use ExpressVPN to tell Netflix that you're in the UK and it pops up. I also use the same trick to switch my location to Canada and watch what is arguably one of the best movies of all time, The Shawshank Redemption. This works for thousands of other titles too. So if you can't find what you're looking for, just look up where it's playing online and chances are they have it. The app works on your phone, laptop, even smart TVs. So you can watch your shows from the comfort of your couch or or on the go. And it's super fast, there's zero buffering. ExpressVPN is the go-to VPN because it's been rated number one by CNET, The Verge, and countless others. And I get why, it's so easy to use. To make sure you take advantage of all your streamers have to offer, go to expressvpn.com slash new rockstars to get an additional three months of ExpressVPN free. So we circle back to our nexus moment of July 7th, 2008, on the corner of La Cienega and Sunset Boulevard. The night we could say everything changed for Tobey Maguire's public image. Get the f out of the way! I can't see! But what if, instead of lashing out at the paparazzi, Tobey Maguire didn't open his door? What if he just takes a breath, he looks past the flashing cameras to across the street on that block of Sunset Boulevard? What's there across the street? Stand-up comedy venue, The Laugh Factory. A year and a half before this night, on that very stage, Michael Richards' career ended when he lost his cool in a racist rant during a set. So in this moment, let's say Tobey Maguire looks at The Laugh Factory and he remembers the power of TMZ. So Tobey relies on his yoga training and he calms himself. And he says to himself, Gonna cry? No, this is my gift, my curse. Who am I? I'm still Spider-Man. So Toby rolls down his window, he looks at the paparazzi dead in the eye, and he says, hey guys, pizza time. He hands the paparazzi his takeout box of leftover pizza from Medeo Ristorante. And what was a TMZ headline about a dying star losing his cool is now a charming blurb about a friendly neighborhood Toby. And instead of turning right on Sunset Boulevard, Toby instead turns left and he drives westbound on Sunset Boulevard to the Viper Room. He meets Molly Bloom. He announces his retirement from gambling and he lets Molly keep the card shuffling machine for free and gives her a $10,000 tip. No need to bark this time. And my friends, we skew into a branch timeline. It's still July 7th, 2008, the same night, and Toby keeps driving through Hollywood. Having sworn off gambling, this committed and obsessive personality needs a new fix. His mind is racing, seeking a new hobby to tickle his fancy. Something dark, but safe this time. Something unique to the Hollywood nightlife. Something where he could use his card handling skills from his poker days. As if guided by a spider sense, a web of life and destiny, Toby turns left on La Brea, then right on Franklin, and he looks up, and what's there? The Magic Castle. The Magic Castle is a historic private club and magic venue in the Hollywood Hills. Yes, my friends, I'm not joking. This place is actually called the Magic Castle. It's a haven to Los Angeles nerds of a certain age with limited social skills. In this alternate timeline, Toby Maguire spends the next 18 months pouring himself into magic classes. Bringing us to January 2010 in this branch timeline. In this timeline, Sony has never canceled Spider-Man 4, and Tobey Maguire and Sam Raimi get to work. Sam Raimi stressing over Avi Arad's demands to add the lizard to his plans of using the vulture as the main villain. But Tobey Maguire, now loving magic, pitches a new idea to incorporate all of these villains in a single plot line that makes perfect sense. The primary villain of Spider-Man 4 is now the master illusionist Mysterio. Bruce Campbell had been there since the beginning, after all, as the announcer at that Macho Man Randy Savage wrestling match. So in this alternate version of the film, Vulture and the Lizard are the ones plaguing the city. Mysterio is leading a misinformation campaign that Spider-Man is to 
to blame for the chaos. J. Jonah Jameson rallies the city to hire someone to clean up the mess, Craven the Hunter, played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan. But Craven goes too far with his task and sets his sights on hunting the Spider-Man. As storyboarded, Peter Parker would end the movie kissing MJ, but in a twist, is shot in the back by Craven. But did this really happen? Because this alternate script's ending would reveal that Peter Parker's entire life as Spider-Man, back to that first spider bite, may have been an illusion cast by Mysterio. Was the life real or was it a dream? Since everyone loved Inception's ending the year before, this movie would end in a similarly ambiguous note. Bringing us to May 6, 2011 in this branch timeline, Spider-Man 4 releases and bombs. Of course it does. That idea sucks. It makes only $500 million on a $250 million budget, which in Hollywood math means yo. When asked what happened here, Sam Raimi tells The Hollywood Reporter, ultimately this is my fault. Toby was just so enthusiastic about the whole magic and illusion angle, and we all just kind of went along with it because he's so nice. And he kept giving us pizza. The truth is, my fellow watchers, there was just no coming back from 2007 Spider-Man 3. The internet had already sealed its fate. Sam Raimi could never have delivered on the fourth movie Sony wanted him to make, and audiences wanted something new. Remember, this is 2011. Camp and color were out. Muted, moody, mumblecore was in. Tobey Maguire would end up starring in 2013's Now You See Me film, becoming obsessed with sleight of hand and making that his whole thing. In 2017, in this branch timeline, Tobey Maguire is arrested after a Vanity Fair article exposes Maguire's years-long sleight of hand pickpocket operation in Hollywood clubs, a ring that Tobey Maguire calls the Presto Posse. But Maguire vanishes from police custody and is never found. 2014 branch timeline. The Sony hack would be inevitable. And after this scandal, Pascal would submit to Kevin Feige's proposal for an MCU Spider-Man reboot, her sandwich, however, stolen by the Presto Posse. And they would immediately seek a new, moody Andrew Garfield of this generation, because in this timeline, they would never have that second step to learn lessons from. But since it's 2014, and Andrew Garfield is now too old for the role of a teenage Peter Parker, they have to find someone new. Meanwhile, in this branch timeline, we'll just say that Andrew Garfield is just living out, eh, let's say, on some Elgort's career. The Divergent films, Baby Driver, and since Andrew Garfield loves musicals, West Side Story. He's doing fine for now. So looking for a new young teenage moody Peter Parker, who in the year 2014 would be perfect for this part? There's really only one actor in Hollywood who can pull this off, and that is Timothy Chalamet. In this branch timeline, Timothy Chalamet has never gotten DiCaprio's advice to never do hard drugs and never do superhero movies, and he takes the job. He becomes the MCU Spider-Man. So now, 2016 branch timeline, Timothy Chalamet crushes Captain America's Civil War. It's an authentic New York Peter Parker. 2017, Spider-Man Homecoming. Chalamet and Peter Parker hits it off with Zendaya. He fights Donald Glover Prowler, who uses reclaimed Stark tech because we had already seen Vulture in the 2011 failed movie. 2018, Avengers Infinity War. Chalamet Peter Parker says, Mr. Stark, I feel everything, and he breaks our hearts. 2019 branch timeline, Spider-Man Far From Home. In London, Chalamet Peter Parker fights Chameleon, played by, get this, Tom Holland. Tom Holland Chameleon destroys Timothy Chalamet and Peter Parker's reputation by committing crimes suited up as the false Spider-Man. And this alternate version of Spider-Man Far From Home, freaking great. Leading to 2021 Spider-Man No Way Home. Of course, a multiverse story, so rumors begin swirling that somehow, somehow, Sony tracked down the fugitive Tobey Maguire for a cameo. And the rumors end up being true. Toby walks through a sparkle portal. There end up being even more magic bits in the movie, and there's a weird tearful reunion scene with Bruce Gamble Mysterio. But you know, in the way that we all pretend to care about the Reese Ipins lizard in the Jamie Foxx Electro in our timelines, No Way Home, we just kind of go with it here. It's now December 17th, 2021, in this branch timeline. The cast celebrates at LA's Viper Room, and everybody's there. Timothy Chalamet, Tobey Maguire, Tom Holland, Zendaya, Leonardo DiCaprio, Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, Donald Glover, Molly Bloom, James Cameron, Posse's Presto, and Pussy. But the party gets out of hand. Timothy Chalamet, whom no one has ever told to not do hard drugs, does hard drugs. He collapses outside. Toby shrieks. He throws Chalamet in his SUV. He tries to pull out onto Sunset Boulevard, but the paparazzi are everywhere. And there are cars there! There are cars there, mother Toby, blinded, peers out into the Sunset Strip. He doesn't see the driver who's rounding the curve, belting show tunes behind the wheel. Andrew Garfield. The two cars collide in a fiery plume. Chalamet and Garfield dead, but Tobey Maguire's body is never found. But every year on this day, the sidewalk on this block of Sunset Boulevard is adorned with a bouquet and a slice of pizza with a note reading, pizza time. While it can be easy to look back at a fourth Sam Raimi Tobey Maguire Spider-Man film and wonder what if 
The tides of Hollywood can only branch so far. Whether to distance from a temperamental Toby or Sam Raimi truly was creatively overwhelmed, the Toby era of the franchise needed to end with Spider-Man 3 to give way to a third times a charm version of the character played by Tom Holland. Why? So that one day this web of life and destiny would unite three brothers from three different eras that we were ready to see again. Sometimes the most heroic thing a Spider-Man can do is get the f*** out of the way!